Hello everyone, we're starting out another Twitter Spaces by Economics Design. Um, today we'll be talking about the Reserve Utility Token Mechanism. Um, that's something that Kiefer came up with. Um, we usually do research and try to find new mechanisms to solve problems that, that are common in our space. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about one of these. But before we dive in, um, and also to have a little bit more time for others to join, I think it's, it's good if we start with a couple of introductions and some opening thoughts. So I, I can start. I'm Gio or Giovanni. Uh, today I'm running here the, the host account, but I'm also a consultant at Economics Design. So I work, I work together with Kiefer, um, focus more on infra and DeFi and past experience in M&A private banking. So that's a little bit of me, but Kiefer, please, you're the star today. So if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I have, uh, well, I guess I'll start with where, where I'm currently at. So I'm a consultant at economics design. Um, my focus is a bit more on the gaming side. So helping top teams like, uh, Shrapnel, Sparkadia and Scopely with figuring out what it actually means to design a sustainable economy. I've been uh, involved in the crypto space since 2014 or so. Um, and I've really been, uh, diving deep into the intersection of uh, virtual worlds, economics, and crypto. And I uh, got into the space a little bit more professionally in 2018, originally doing some systems design for a crypto racing game, um, and then uh, went into doing some economic and statistical design for a company building out crypto casinos and exchanges. So I've been working out different types of uh, incentive systems and token models and, and various types of mechanisms there for uh, for a while uh, related to crypto projects and have uh, been at economics design since 2021 and uh, been working across web3 with different types of projects but really enjoying creating different types of mechanisms for uh, web3 games and uh, that's that's what we're really going to be digging into today particularly new mo uh, new model that i think is going to be uh, quite useful or a good tool for teams to explore yeah, that's great. That's great introduction. And I think it's also good for us to introduce a little bit of econ design. Uh, so just as very quick, because I think some of you already know us, but what we do in a nutshell is we look at the economic part of, of token economies. So anything that is Web3 related and has incentives, mechanism design involved to it, um, we work with clients to make sure that these designs and these mechanisms are really sustainable and have like long-term sustainability. So we do things such as like economic audits up until like a full scope mandate in which we design everything from zero um, to a full structured financial model with all of the partners. So this is a little bit of what we do. And that's the context of today. Um, I think what Kiefer is going to be talking about is one of the ideas that can be applied. Um, this is like a general idea. It can be applied in different scenarios with different tweaks. Um, but before we dive in, I wanted to just touch base on some general opening thoughts because I think that we're in a pretty interesting time in the market. And like since the beginning of like 2022, really, we entered in this bear cycle. And I think a lot of the narratives and the focus of the community, of the Web3 community of the builders um, is shifting as well. And I think like in my personal experience, something that I saw is that before most of the projects were really focused on like What's the price of the token? Why is it going to be valuable in the future? Or like speculative kind of narratives. And I think that for the past couple of months, we've seen a much bigger influence and focus on like development of infrastructure, of real business cases that have consistent revenue flows. Um, and also on the side of the venture capitalists and investment funds, uh, a more smarter and picky kind of investment. Um, I think that on, on our end, we've seen a lot of infrastructure projects coming to us on like various niches. So for science, for scalability, for um, DeFi as a whole. So this is like really good because I think that's what was missing in the last cycle. Um, I just wanted to know if you have any thoughts on this uh, before we dive straight into the, the key topic. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm um, going to be talking about the reserve utility token model. Um, and so this is a um, an overview of a collection of different types of mechanisms or strategies that you can use for creating a token that is meant to accrue value. Um, and it's generally targeted toward the gaming projects. However, this is something that can be broadly applied, I believe, 
uh, relatively widely uh, across any type of Web3 project that both has uh, is trying to design a value accruing token and has NFTs uh, involved with it. Um, and so the, uh, the kind of general uh, overview here, and I can get a lot more into the, to the details of how it works, um, is that going to essentially be taking the token that is, that is meant to accrue value and having a requirement that some of that token be locked up as a reserve um, when creating a specific NFT in uh, in this ecosystem. And so this is an NFT that can represent any type of value um, in the project. It could be something that's more of a cosmetic value. Um, so maybe a, a certain type of uh, hat or other cosmetic asset within inside a game. But it can also be much more broadly uh, applied to something that is re related to a time benefit, a status benefit, a power benefit. Maybe it's a pass that increases the inventory size of your account uh, or gives you the ability to fast travel. It's something that uh, in it, on its own, there is a, a dollar cost portion of it. So maybe there's a baseball cap NFT and they're paying uh, $1. Uh, and But then an additional requirement on that is that they also lock up $1 worth of the token. And uh, the the uh, pricing can be adjusted over time. Uh, it could be adjusted depending on what the team wants. Maybe they're focusing on accruing more value to the token, and so they have a larger uh, requirement for the amount that needs to be staked. And so there's a lot of flexibility on how the team sets up the pricing for it. Um, but the way that this asset is supposed to accrue value um, is that essentially um, as there's fundamental demand coming in from the benefit that this NFT provides, um, at the same time, it's uh, requiring people to essentially buy these tokens um, and sort of soft lock them up in order to get that benefit. So as the number of users who are uh, who have demand for the fundamental NFT rises, which should happen if you're creating a quality game um, and attracting users in general, then it's increasing demand uh, for this token. But uh, crucially, this is something that can be relatively well abstracted away as, as part of the experience. So um, when trying to attract web users, um, having a, a token be front and center can be problematic. Okay. Saying, of kind of forcing someone into buying a token um, and you have to convey what that token is, how to get it, that has problems with the onboarding process. And so in this this way, you can sort of abstract away the token part of it. Um, you could even do that, the purchase and swap to that token on behalf of that user. And so their focus is just, they're just buying an NFT, but at the same time, it's still leveraging uh, that that benefit of of accruing value to the token. Yeah, I think that's a great introduction. And before we we actually go to like examples or very specifics of like how the mechanism works, um, I think it's good for us to to explore of like what are the motivations? Like what? Why did we start thinking of this? So like why do we need something as a reserve for an NFT? So now basically what we're creating here is a collateral that creates kind of a floor or at least a couple of assets that um, can represent the minimum intrinsic value of that NFT. So what's the, uh, it would be good if you could explore a little bit on like, what's the motivation, like what kind of problem it tries to solve um, when you put this reserve utility token attached to an NFT? Yeah. And so uh, first off, I'll, I want to focus, I, I want to point out that this, the comparison of whether or not this makes sense um, for a particular project should not be um, to use this model versus uh, to not have a value accruing token at all. Uh, and that's it's the focus is more on if the team has decided that they want to have a value accrual token within their ecosystem, should they implement it using a reserve utility token model or alternative models um, that in the past have focused uh, significantly on uh, having uh, a dividend or uh, buyback and burn types of strategies. Um, those types of strategies have legal issues, have very clear legal issues behind them of 
um, doing value for all in such a way that the activity is solely focused on price manipulation. Um, so if you're doing a buyback and burn, really the only reason for it is because you're trying to manipulate the price. Um, and uh, relatively similarly with uh, with dividends versus in this case, uh, you're talking um, the the focus of, uh, of the purchase of the asset by the player is really on attaining that particular benefit and any and the increase in demand and price of that asset is much more of a byproduct in this scenario. So it's a portion of a of a legal, uh, hopefully a, a slightly better uh, legal argument. Um, but going uh, going going back to uh, yeah, like what what is the the motivation here? Uh, so it's it's balancing uh, being able to create a strong value accrual proposition. Um, with having that better chance of legal compliance and having a an experience where you can have this token that accrues value without being uh, damaging to a Web2 user experience. So they don't actually have to interact with a token to have, uh, they can just be interested in getting this fundamental value and still be benefiting the value accrual of that token. Um, and. Um, and so, yeah, with with this design, um, there's it also has improvements over some models where the where so with teams that have moved away from trying to have a token that accrues value by uh, it giving dividends or it's uh, or the buyback and burn, they'll they'll often move towards spending the token, and this is a bit of a problem as well because if you have a token that's meant to accrue value. And if you sold it to investors, then you inherently have that goal because they're expecting the price of that token to go up. Then it's not really viable to have that be a token where you expect users to spend it uh, or at least spend to the same extent that they would with a dollar or a currency that's relatively stable. Uh, because if they think the price of the token is going to go up, they there's kind of this opportunity cost to actually spending it. They uh, they could choose to to hold it and gain the benefit and gain um, and potentially make money if they think the value of that token is going to rise over time, which makes them uh, much more hesitant to actually spend it. And so that's that's another area where um, we're trying to to balance these different components of value, coral, legal uh, compliance, and user experience. Um, and so in in this case, you don't actually have to uh, give up custody of that. Uh, of the token, you're still retaining that price exposure, uh, and yeah. So overall, we're, it's kind of a, a triple or three gold focus of value accrual, uh, better shot at legal compliance, and and disclaimer: this has not been, uh, this has not gone through a legal review yet. May still have uh, legal issues, but just trying to create an option that is likely to be better uh, from a legal perspective than some of the models out there. Um, and then also that that improved Web2 user experience. Yeah, and I think it's such on a couple of points um, that start getting into like the pricing conversation. So how does this affect price? And I think that you mentioned a couple of things. One is like how stable the token is to be a reference for price. Um, and the other one is kind of like how this reserve creates a floor or a soft floor or soft cap, depending on how you make this mechanism, how you designed it. Um, so I just wanted to to understand in terms of pricing, do you see this do you see this creating kind of like a range of possible prices in which it ranges from like the minimum, which is the token value that is uh, um, backing it, and a maximum that either the project can can set or something that is automated. Um, and also, how do you see the like the token that is backing? so the 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 variance in this token affecting uh, um, this collateral? So like, would it be better to have a stable or semi-stable asset or is having like a value accrual token that has a lot of variance um, also good for a reserve token like this one? Okay, so kind of, yeah, kind of a lot of, a lot of points there. I'll focus in on the impact this has on the secondary, expect the secondary market pricing. Um, and so... Uh, we kind of alluded to how this is creating a bit of a price window. And so what I mean by that is that for the NFT, if you think about just a a base NFT model, so not part of this model, but just NFTs in general, they 
there is not a there's not really a constraint on the price the price could go anywhere from zero to infinity um but it doesn't necessarily have to be the case and so um part of having the reserves locks behind this specific nft is that it creates a bit of a loose floor and and this is specifically a loose floor because it's the value of the token in the reserves in dollar terms is going to change over time because the value of that token will fluctuate but um unless that token goes fully to zero then you have some level of price floor greater than zero that can be instantly redeemed so uh so as of right now with nfts generally there's no instant liquidity um users who are familiar with uh with who look at fungible tokens or they're used to or maybe it's a web 2 user that's used to being able to sell uh stocks um or, or things that are very liquid um nfts generally are not that liquid um in terms often there's not existing or standing buy orders uh for assets and so your ability to actually sell it very quickly is uh is quite limited and so you have this ability to instantly uh sell sell the asset uh or burn the nft in order to reclaim the tokens in the reserves and that creates this uh this price floor where you're guaranteed to at least be able to get something and you're able to do that redemption essentially instantly uh, it could probably be even abstracted so that you the tokens are instantly sold as well if that's what the uh the person wanted so they're able to instantly get some value back for that nft and so yeah some value greater than zero and so that's the floor price side of it and then another component of this model another mechanism that strengthens this um, is implementing a price ceiling uh, for that nft and so when i say a price ceiling i mean it in um, a way that is enforced through the primary market it's not it's not just saying oh we'll programmatically prevent it from trading higher it's the mechanism itself is that the uh so the game studio behind it they say um and going back to to like a baseball cap example they have say you have a, a baseball cap nft you're selling it for uh you're selling it for two dollars um and the, t- the team will say we will always sell this baseball cap nft or you can buy as many of them as you want for two dollars and so that means that um it doesn't make sense to list it on the secondary market for higher than two dollars uh as long as everybody knows as long as there's there's perfect information about the ability to purchase it on the primary market for two dollars and so the price ceiling is created by that open offer from the studio and yes this does mean that the supply of this nft is inherently uncapped and i um and i should should give the and i should clarify that this is focusing on assets that are meant to be accessible so this is not for your rare status symbol asset um it's not for anything that's supposed to be exclusive um or supposed to have super high secondary market pricing um, and, and and that's where a lot of NFTs have been up to this point. Um, but realistically, if you want to have um, push the idea of really having tradable assets that are widely available to a lot of people, um, you do have to have uh, a lot of assets that don't have a limited supply and have accessible pricing. And so this is more more focused towards that type of asset. Um, and that's also allows a greater scale that ties into to the token value accrual component. Um, and so, uh yes yeah, so you have this this kind of uh wider wider supply asset um and the and so the secondary market pricing um is going to be somewhere between that that rough price floor of um the token reserves and that ceiling price set by the team um and, and then in terms of how the market actually prices it um this is where it could potentially get um a little bit more complicated um because there is there's a few kind of uh, kind of components of it. Uh, it's how one, how much do people b- value the fundamental benefit that that NFT provides? Um, and so, if it gives um, like a two x 
XP increase. It increases your experience points earning. That has some inherent value to players. They will pay some amount as a premium benefit to get that. Uh, but then added onto that, there's uh, some level of reserves. Uh, so there's uh, some value of tokens locked up within that NFT, but they can only be achieved by burning that NFT. And so there's also going to be some discount factor on uh, on the, those reserves uh, because it's not you don't clearly get both. It's kind of one or the other. And so that that means so it, it will vary a bit and it will uh, remain roughly within that uh, that kind of price window range. Yeah, and this is actually pretty interesting when we think about primary markets that um, the the gaming company sets like the supply, what's the price, the primary price and everything. Because like if we imagine if they're releasing, let's say 100 tokens and people have to put, <clears throat> you know, example, like $1 to buy, $1 as a reserve. Um, even if this utility, people start pricing it at less than this value and it starts approaching the reserve value. So the pure value of the tokens that are in the reserve the supply is going to be diminishing. At some point, this is going to be so scarce that it's not going to be enough for you to just burn it and get your tokens back. And then secondary market will probably be higher than this. So I think this is a pretty interesting mechanics um, when you think of it in a, in a good way and depending on how your economy is, right? And I think that <clears throat> we mentioned here that one of the things that we're trying to circumvent here is the buyback. Um, we've been hearing a couple of like thoughts and some discussions on like the legal sides. Again, disclaimer, we're not legal advisors. So this is just something, things that we hear um, from like past conversations. But we see that buybacks has a lot of um, questioning from, from regulators. So in terms of like legal um, risks or legal opportunities um, that this creates, what do you see? Do you, you mentioned a little bit, but it would be good to, to talk a little bit more on, on this legal side. Um, with the disclaimer again, that this is not legal advice, it's just some things on our experience. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. And so this is using a, a value accrual token. Um, and I think any project that's using a value accrual token is taking on some level of, of legal risk in the United States. Um, cause I think the, the Howey test could theoretically be applied to if, if applied very broadly, could apply to base, basically any value approving asset. Um, but evidently, there are a lot of legal teams for a lot of projects who have still allowed companies to, to sell tokens. So um, there is still a pretty wide ranging thought that there is some amount of wiggle room. And so the, the goal of this model is really to create the best possible shot at being, uh, being viable there by really focusing on the, the fundamental utility um, of the assets here. Um, it's kind of trying to be the purest form of a utility token possible uh, because the reasoning why somebody is buying this asset is to uh, get the benefit of that NFT. Um, and the, the reduction in circulating supply is kind of an additional benefit towards doing that, but it's not, it's not the only focus versus like a dividend or buyback and burn model where those mechanics are really only about price manipulation. Um, so it probably would make some sense as well to go over some of the uh, the benefits of this model because they did talk a little bit about about kind of some of the risks there and some of the more complicated pricing components of it. But I just want to uh, kind of be very clear about what some of the impacts that uh, then this can have. And so I, I own kind of like eight different uh, benefits, and one of and uh, the first one and one that I, I found pretty interesting is that you have a uh, flexible and predictable value accrual between equity and tokens. And so in, in a lot of different models, it's uh, it's not obviously very clear how teams are are splitting revenue between uh, the the equity holders and the token holders. And so the equity holders, that's, that's going to be focused on the, the team, probably some VC investors, while the, the token holders are the same entities, but then also potentially the retail crowd. Um, and when thinking about trying to understand the potential for appreciation, um, it's often hard to figure out exactly how some of that, that revenue is being split, how values are accruing to the tokens. Uh, but in this model, it's very explicitly laid out. You can see directly in the pricing of every asset in the, in the ecosystem, how much, um, of 
uh, of this is going as revenue to the team and how much of this is um, a is is having the user lock up some tokens and i'll i'll give a i'll make sure it's clear on a particular nuance here that uh if going back to the example of, of like the baseball cap they spend two dollars on the baseball cap one dollar is going to as revenue um uh, to the equity holders and then one dollar um, is used to uh, buy tokens and uh and lock them up or if they already have a dollar worth of token they can lock it up themselves and crucially that the amount for the tokens that's never right re revenue to the team that doesn't affect the equity holders at all that is only betting uh, benefiting token holders and that also mean that nuance also means that this is not a buyback and lock it's not like a buyback and lock there's no buyback that amount is never fully controlled by uh or never on, uh, on the balance sheet of the the company or equity holders in general um and so you can really control um for the particularly particular goals you have about how much you're trying to impact equity versus uh benefiting the token and this this also means that there is uh an economic lever there it's you can you can change what that distribution looks like over time um and so maybe you want to uh, increase uh, you need kind of additional funding for the team and that means that you're increasing the price of the assets. Maybe you increase the price of that baseball cap um, uh, to uh, to three dollars, and so maybe it's two dollars of revenue, one dollar of game, um, or you do it the reverse. You could maybe you're trying to drive more uh, more stake into the token, um, and you um, uh, yeah, and so I'm saying like the game just naming the token as game for reference. That's that's what I use in the paper. So that's what I mean if I say you had a game token. Um, and so now you have maybe the sticker price is $3. $1 is going uh, as revenue to the team. $2 is staked. Um, and it's the, the, the sunk cost of how much is actually spent on the asset is still only $1. Uh, but now you have increased the, uh, the quantity of token staked and the corresponding value accrual benefits. Um, I also touched on how there's immediate liquidity potential now, since you're able to burn the NFT to get the reserve tokens. And in doing so, um, you um, get this liquidity benefit that you really don't, that um, is, is widely not available across most of the NFT space. Um, and then this also has an impact on buyer confidence and willingness to spend, uh, because if you have uh, the uh, the ability to redeem uh, some of this, uh, or you're able to to redeem something instantly, it still has some value for your NFT. Um, then that can increase your uh, your willingness to spend. Uh, there's also kind of some different um, kind of psychological implications of um, having of spending and not and getting nothing back versus locking something up. Uh, because if you're if you're just locking tokens up um that's that's not the same as uh just spending something um and so this is this is something that uh developers can kind of play around with with how people actually react to a lockup versus a spend and how much they're actually willing to do that how much they can change the value of the asset and they're still getting the benefit um as the team holds a large quantity of tokens they're still benefiting from doing that even if it's uh, at the cost of a reduction and some revenue uh, then there's the component of discouraging uh, excessive speculation um, on NFTs. I uh, touched a, a bit on this one already, um, but if you're really trying to have something that's accessible to a large amount of people, then having that ceiling price really uh, benefits your ability to make sure that um, people can get the assets that they need in order to actually progress in the game or get some base level of benefits without speculators kind of ruining that market and making it inaccessible. And there's also some built-in uh, resilience to external marketplace fluctuations. Um, and so this, this is something that we've seen a lot um, with companies that have tokens in the past where uh, the crypto market will shift and the price of the token will bounce all over the place. And that can potentially uh, scare off some, uh, some different users. But in, in this case, uh, when uh, if if the price of the token uh, drops, 
then um, since the the quantity of of tokens locked up um, for for every new purchase of an NFT um, that increases since the the dollar value of tokens that are locked up in that NFT stays the same. So if it's always one dollar worth of these uh, of these tokens that are that are locked up, as the value of of the tokens drop, it means for every new NFT created, that's more tokens that are getting locked, and it creates a bit of a counteracting force to uh, to this market fluctuations. So if the demand for game assets stays um, stays roughly consistent, you still have a solid player uh, player base of kind of traditional gamers, then they can provide a counteracting force um, that mitigates the impacts of some of these external uh, crypto market fluctuations that might uh, have an external negative impact on the token price. Um, there's also the, uh, the uh, so if someone is holding the token already, they, they're, they're not disincentivized from uh, actually engaging in buying an NF NFT. Um, so in other models where you have to spend your token in order to get an NFT, in those cases, you're losing your price exposure to the, to the token. So for those kind of like Web3 users where you want, where they likely already have the token, um, in this case, you can kind of get them more locked into the ecosystem by still pushing them to, to get an NFT, but they can retain that price exposure. This the, the amount of tokens that they locked up, they still have the potential to redeem them later if, if they burn the NFT. And so that's a bit of a benefit there. And kind of the last benefit I'll, I'll touch on here is uh, the potential use of tokens without uh, kind of that big fiat on-ramp issue. Um, so if you're able to, uh, and so I guess as, as reference, often uh, people are trying to go from fiat into uh, a cryptocurrency. There's a high rate, rate of bank failure on uh, these transactions, but it is a much better success rate if you're buying a digital item versus a digital currency. Um, and so if the purchase can be made for an item rather than a currency, then uh, you have a much better shot of that going through. Um, but we'll say there's, there's still, I think, some implementation details to, to work out um, on how that would work and potential legal perspectives there. But I think it is a really interesting uh, kind of route to explore around that particular issue. It's a very, very good overview. And I think that from, from hearing you speak, I think it's clear that this idea has a lot of benefits. So here we're talking about um, an asset that is very uh, that fluctuates a lot in price. It's very variable, um, and a lot of times it's hard to understand really what's uh, the expectation of the market of like what's the intrinsic value of this asset. So I think this is um, a model that tries to kind of like create boundaries and show the direction of like what's the price reference, what's in it, um, how much people are committed to it, and also creates other um, tools for the for the development team to really control, right? You mentioned like an economic lever. So it's something that teams can lever to really control. So if things are going bad or if things are going good, they can adjust um, as needed. So I think that the benefits are there. And if you, again, you have to think very well on how this applies to your economy. Um, but before we go to a couple of like alternative uh, um, items, because here we're talking about plain vanilla uh, um, NFTs, right? But we can go a little bit further. But before we talk about this, it would be good to understand the flip side. So when we're talking about risks and when we're talking about what what are the counter forces for these benefits, um, what are the key things that uh, uh, development teams should be looking for and should be careful with? Yeah, so obviously one of the biggest ones is legal. And so, yeah, as we've already said, this is uh, not legal advice and all of these uh, should be vetted by their legal teams uh, to get an understanding of the level of risk um, that they have, that they hold, and whether that's acceptable to the team, um, because any kind of value growing token is take on some level of risk there. Um, and then uh, some other potential risks. Um, one is around uh, kind of correlated NFT and token uh, devaluation. Um, and so, uh, if if both the NFT and token value kind of drops at the same time then it could lead to to some users kind of going for that quick liquidity um, and burning and selling a lot of tokens at one time. Um, but I but I don't think this is uh, to the point where you have like an extremely bad 
negative cycle because uh, you have the counteracting points of uh, the NFTs still have fundamental utility to users in the ecosystem. So if, if this is purely just a drop in speculative demand, um, there's still kind of that counteracting force there where if there's still a lot of players, then uh, you don't even necessarily have to have new players step in, but just the, your existing player base now uh, kind of this premium benefit. So this premium gameplay benefit just kind of it essentially went on sale. It's now cheaper to get some key benefit that maybe you're willing to pay for it now that it's at a lower level. And so that's a counteracting force that is again tied really to that fundamental demand from users, not just kind of speculative demand for for the assets. And so that does kind of counter uh, that speculative drop. Um, but if the if the fundamental demand is dropping, so really your your core players are uh, are cycling out then um, yes, the, the price is going to drop because these assets are tied to the, the fundamental demand and fundamental benefits of the game. But I think that should be the expected scenario. Um, but that is something that should be thought about and planned of how, how these, these systems would evolve over time. Um, maybe the other risk to be aware of is some fractured market liquidity uh, because as users uh, create NFTs at different points in time when the token is uh, at different pricing levels, uh, you would have different reserves at different time periods. And so I uh, would be would want to be aware that uh, it, it would be slightly more difficult than normal to group them into semi-fungible NFT categories and create wide ranging bids that apply to multiple assets. Um, kind of counterpoints to this uh, is that um, if the, you don't necessarily need that, these are inherently non-fungible tokens. So you don't necessarily uh, need to have them all be grouped together for liquidity reasons. Um, and you can also make this a little bit easier with the right marketplace tooling. They could use uh, sort of like a hedonic pricing model where you're separating out kind of the value of the underlying NFT. And so you're saying, I'm willing to bid this amount for uh, this particular NFT that gives a particular benefit. And then, regard and then based on the number of tokens that it has locked up, I'll pay this amount per reserve token. Um, and so then you can still create a more widespread bid uh, based on those kind of split factors. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. I think that um, from from here you uh, explain, I think that projects should really understand if this makes sense for them. And of course, the legal part is something that is very important and it varies, right? It depends on where you are, where you're going to deploy your project. So this is something that is hard to, uh, um, to, to, to say it like, this is the answer because it varies a lot and we're also not, not lawyers. So, but it's definitely something that always comes up in, in discussions with clients. So that's why we focus on it. Um, so that projects can really uh, release all of the features. So I think that we had a lot, a lot more questions, but I'll try to go for the, for the most important ones that I have, but I wanted to, to just touch point. I think we talked a lot about on how this works on a plain vanilla way. So it would just be good to hear from you. Like if you have. When, you, when projects are thinking of actually developing this and deploying this, um, if you have any alternative ideas of, for like NFT design to really um, improve the effects of this model and to, to fit with it or any additional mechanics that would make this uh, stronger. So just so that we give a couple of ideas for the audience in case someone pushes this idea for, forward. Yeah, so I, I listed in the paper a variety of additional mechanisms that I think are really synergistic. Um, that can can improve this model. And so um, one of them that I really like is the concept of evolving NFTs. And so um, this is this is basically where you can uh, add re additional retention mechanics to that NFT that disincentivizes uh, burning it. Um, and so you're essentially creating some sort of additional like tangible or emotional benefit that would be lost on that burn. And so it could be like you get an, ex uh, an experience booster, but it took you six months of holding or playing in order to get that. Um, or maybe the cosmetic benefits improve over time, or it's a personal stat tracker, something that makes them a bit more attached to that asset and more hesitant to actually burn it. And that creates a stronger lockup mechanic for the token. And this is, this is really leveraging some psychological biases uh, from the, the field of behavioral economics. Um, so the first one of those is the idea of loss aversion. Um, and so 
this is kind of the feeling of they are giving up something valuable um, if they uh, choose to rede- uh, redeem or trade uh, the NFTs. Um, it's kind of the idea is that there's like a really it it hurts more uh, to have a loss than an equivalent uh, gain. And so the the fear of loss is a uh, fear of loss of any sort of benefits here is a pretty powerful motivator for players to keep playing and engaging. Um, and so it's focused more on that uh, losing something, uh, kind of the, a stick rather than a than a carrot here. Um, and then and this is a, a sort of related effect is the endowment effect, where um, people assign more value to something uh, because they they own that asset. And that feeling generally gets stronger if they have a more personal connection uh, with that item. And so they, that means they have a higher like personal valuation of it, um, which reduces, is going to reduce how much they're willing to sell it for, reduce their likelihood to kind of sell or uh, especially burn that asset. Uh, and so, yeah, it's really about leveraging those biases to uh, increase attachment there and uh, better increase the value accrual potential. Um, and so, there's also kind of the price ceiling component. Um, so for for the assets that have uh, that are meant to be more accessible, i kind of already talked talked about this one, but it's useful in, in various scenarios. Um, another one is thinking about what happens with temporary NFTs. So some benefits are um, inherently going to be uh, temporary. Uh, so maybe you're not doing like a permanent battle pass. NFT model, but maybe it's just like the more standard, like month long battle pass, but you still want to represent it as an NFT and you still want to lock up tokens in the process. So you have to actually think about, uh, what, what you're going to do with those token reserves. Um, and so you could have it as, um, some potential implementations are maybe those reserves are, uh, diminished over time. Um, and so gradually as you use that benefit up more, um, it goes to the team or with the battle pass model specifically, you could even have it transfer to the benefits that a battle pass provides. So for example, if you have different milestones that give out different, uh, cosmetic NFTs, as you achieve that milestone and get that cosmetic NFT, some of the reserves from the battle pass are transferred into that, uh, that asset that you got out as a benefit. And so as, as you use the battle pass up more or, or progress through it more, um, the reserves are being depleted from that and going into the other assets. Um, or, or it could be something where um, you have, it's kind of like a subscription and it goes down over time with the reserves going to the team. And so just get, starting to, to get teams thinking about lots of ways that you can mess around with that, this idea and it can be viable for more temporary assets as well. Um, there's another component um, that's created in a little bit of a response to a potential issue. Um, and that's having a sort of an automatic excessive reserve distribution. And so if you have tokens uh, locked up as a reserve, there's uh, a pretty decent chance that they might go up in value over time. And so if those the value of the reserves in dollar terms goes up significantly from the price of the token increasing, um, then you get players who now they feel like they might want to burn, not because they, they want to sell the NFT, but just because the value of the reserves has increased so much, maybe it's worth significantly more than the, the NFT itself. And it could be a bad experience if uh, they they really like that NFT and don't want to burn it. Um, and so you could have this kind of automatic distribution where if it the value of the reserves in dollar terms exceeds some price level, uh, then kind of it's a little bit of shaved off the top and given uh, and just immediately distributed um, as like as liquid tradable tokens to that uh, to that player, just so um, the you don't get too excessive with the value of those reserves and create um, kind of a, a bad user experience. Um, and then the last sort of uh, potential uh, add-on or adjustment to the model that I find quite interesting is the idea of a semi-stable currency. And so this is an alternative option to using like dollars or stable coins. So it's not a replacement for like the reserve utility token or like the value accruing asset itself. It's a replacement for the asset that fundamentally acts as a currency in the system. Um, and so 
Um, like when we're talking about a currency in a Web3 context, um, very frequently people throwing around the term cryptocurrencies, these volatile coins really are not good currencies. Um, you, from the traditional economic definition, you need something that is a good store of value, a good unit of account, and high volatility in both directions, uh, up and down, kind of breaks both of those requirements. And so you need something with some level of stability. And so teams that get to that point of realization, some often I see them just jumping straight towards, well, I guess we'll just use fiat, or I guess we'll just use stable coin, uh, depending on how they're implementing it. And just pointing out that you don't, that there is another option. And so that's kind of the idea of a semi-stable currency where you're, you have your own currency that you have monetary policy control over, but you're adding in additional mechanisms to one, increase confidence in the value of that currency and two, disincentivize speculation. Um, and so the, it's, you're creating this price window. And so there are two mechanisms, one to enforce the floor value, one to enforce the ceiling value. Um, and so on the enforcing like the floor value, so making sure that people feel that this is they they could go away for a while, come back, and they'd still have roughly similar purchasing power of that asset. And that's through using reserves. And so at, currencies are, they're really based on trust when it comes down to it. So you can supplement some of that trust by using an asset, by holding reserves of an asset that people trust more. And so you could hold reserves in, uh, in a stable coin. And so you're still kind of using stable coins, leveraging the trust of stable coins, um, but not, not creating like a one-to-one -one scenario. So you could hold, um, a good chunk of, of reserves. And so that this creates a foreign play price so that you publicly show these reserves and players know they're always able to redeem for at least this certain price level. Um, and then on the high end, you can disincentivize speculation with, um, a price ceiling. This is the same mechanic I talked about before, where uh, with NFTs, where you're able, where the the supply is completely flexible. You'll always sell more at that ceiling price, and it doesn't make sense for anyone to sell for higher than that because uh, the core team will always sell for that certain amount. Um, and so this this hasn't, to my knowledge, been leveraged in Web three, but it's not a new idea. It's um, it was used originally in uh, in Second Life. It's pretty interesting because you're talking about all of these mechanisms and like different ways we can go about it and i hope it's clear that when we think of an idea like this when we think of a design this is a tool right this is like a piece in the puzzle that can be put in like different puzzles different ways um, and it can be improved in different ways so when we're, when keeper is talking about these kind of specifics that's where you go back and you think about your design your purpose what value your project generates and you think of what you can apply so the example you gave is, is, is very good. So if you have a subscription model, um, you can have an NFT that is that has temporary reserves. So these reserves can be diminishing until it reaches zero. And then you have to pay the subscription again. Um, subscription in NFTs is something that people have tried to figure out for a long time. And selling a one-off NFT for a pass or for access to something is not sustainable because these are just one-time sales. So these are just a couple of things that um, you have to think when you see a design, when you see an idea like this. Um, but yeah, this is a very interesting topic and it solves a lot of a lot of issues that we have generally in projects. So I think we could go on for like two hours here very easily, just talking about the different ways to implement the different uh, um, niches that this can be applied more easily or that have the pain points um, uh, more severely. Um, but yeah, I think we're right over time. So Keeper, if you wanted to give just final thoughts on what's what's in the future, um, how you plan on, on 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 developing this, if you are, and just contact info if anyone wants to talk to you about this or about any other consulting uh, uh, matters. Yeah, so uh, yeah, definitely going to be continuing to, to discuss this idea with various teams. Already had a few kind of um, reach out with the, with interest and so uh, we'll we'll see more realistically how this applies in different contexts I think in the near future um, and uh, yeah happy to discuss this further if anyone has has questions about this um, or uh, help with their their particular uh, game or project happy to 
to chat, uh, feel free to DM me uh, here on Twitter or on LinkedIn. Uh, those are always open. And uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Perfect. And just as a reminder, um, if you want to know more, just go and keep his profile on Economics and Science website. We have the full article there in which he, he talks about all of the specifics, and then you can use that as the, the main reference for this idea. But thank you, everyone who joined. I think this was a great conversation. So thank you, Kiefer. And we'll be back in the next one. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.